everyone. This is uh, Rob, and he's going to talk to us about unions. Uh, pay attention, there should be some interesting stuff. Thank you. All right. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, by way of brief introduction, um, I'm a software developer, obviously, and uh, tech wise, my job is pretty typical. So, I write some Python, I write some SQL queries, um, I run some Linux servers. But um, I guess less typical is that I work for the trade union movement. And so um, after I got a job working for the Australian Council of Trade Unions, um, I was surprised to find that a lot of tech people don't really see the point of unions. And um, it's not necessarily that they, they don't like unions, maybe they just don't see how unions kind of fit into their lives. Now, historically unions have been responsible for all sorts of things that make our, our lives more bearable. Eight hour day, superannuation, paid leave, and stats show that union people enjoy uh, better pay and conditions. But um, I don't want this to be a history lesson, and I feel like that's how a lot of people uh, in the tech world uh, perceive unions. They think it's kind of past history. Maybe they think of unions, think of a photo like this, and these ha harsh conditions at the dock or down a coal mine, they seem kind of a world away from today's uh, comfortable tech offices. We've, we're, we've got great salaries, air conditioning, free food, slide, slides between the floors, all that sort of stuff. But I think that's a mistake because uh, it's easy when you're sitting in an expensive office chair to forget the reality of how employment actually works. And so I, I thought we'd remind ourselves with a simple diagram. And now, while this might not look like it at first, this diagram is actually an accounting diagram. And so over here on the left, uh, yeah, the diagram as a whole is all the money that a particular company brings in every single year. Okay? So for a company like Google, it's obviously a lot of money. And this diagram represents all the, all the different things that money, uh, th that money goes towards. And so over here on the left, we have uh, raw materials. And so in a traditional business, that's things like, uh, things like factories, raw materials, uh, in, a, in a software company, it's like offices and servers on the cloud, that sort of thing. So the next chunk of money goes towards paying staff. So all the employees, they all get salaries, and that's that money there. And the rest of the money goes towards the owners. And so uh, the stuff here in the middle, that's the stuff that uh, people get who uh, go to work every day and do a job. And the, uh, the stuff down the end, that's from the owners. Uh, people get money from uh, owning, owning the right paperwork rather than uh, the actual work that they do. Now, in a small startup, obviously, this, uh, the line between those two sections is very blurry because you have people who work in both roles. Um, so in a startup, a lot of startup em employees, especially if they're early employees, they own stock. Mark Zuckerberg, for some reason, even though he m makes billions a year from Facebook, keeps, uh, keeps turning up and going to work and uh, presumably does some uh, productive work while he's there. But in the context of a larger business, um, the situation is crystal clear. So in, in Walmart in the United States, for example, um, Walmart happens to employ 1% of the entire US workforce, which winds up being about 2 million people, and they all get money from the section in the middle. People who own Walmart, it's mostly uh, owned by four children, who are the children of the founder, they, all, they, they get the money from down the end. And we've been, we've been conditioned to believe that this sort of arrangement is actually normal. But if you stop and think about it, it seems bonkers that you can get thousands of times more from owning things uh, than the people who actually do all the work. People who actually do all the work are in the middle, but that's, they, they, have to split that, uh, they have to split that chunk by two million. The other chunk is, uh, is, is split by like four or so for the most part. And that's where this uh, massive inequality uh, that we have in society today comes from. So you might be thinking, OK, well, you know, that's how it is at Walmart. We know Walmart is a terrible place to work. We know that employees get treated badly there. But you know, at a great modern tech company like Google, the situation is, sh is surely different. And in fact, a very similar dynamic is taking place. So here, uh, this is all the money that is left over at the, at the various tech giants. Uh, per employee after all the salaries have been paid out. And so this, this, is, this is pure profit, and Facebook is making an extra um, $600 per employee uh, after, after they paid out all the salaries, and similarly staggering numbers for all these other tech giants. 
And all this money is money that employers ma employees make, uh, that workers make, that do all the work, but that gets taken from them and given to somebody else. And in fact, the same relationship is at play not only in the context of individual firms, but the overall economy. So the best-selling economics book of the last few years has been Capital in the, in the 21st Century by Thomas Piketty. And so that's fundamentally a discussion of this relationship in the broader economy. And so I should mention that capital is one of those terms with many, many meanings. Sometimes it's, it's uh, referred to the physical things like farm machinery that generate economic output, but uh, Piketty uses it in a more legal sense. So it means anything that you can own legally that gives you a flow of money. So that can inc include ownership of physical equipment, more so, also more abstract things like uh, intellectual property and stocks and land titles and, uh, and all the rest. And so that's the way I'm using it in this discussion. In that diagram I showed you before, the third box with the fat controller from Thomas the Tank Engine, that, is, uh, that, is, that represents capital income. So Piketty refers to these, these two shares as labour share of the national income and capital share of the national income, national income being all the, all the money that, you're, the, that a, a country's economy generates every year. And so that relationship is not only an economic reality and a statistical reality, but it's a political reality. And in fact, it's the story of modern politics, at least in the dimensions of economics and social class. So it's a conflict between the forces of those who get paid for doing the work, rather than the ownership class, and between the interests of the workers and the interests of capital. Of course, these are hardly new ideas. And so back again to this chart, at least the uh, two sections on the right that involve people. So this dividing line is not fixed. Where it's drawn at the moment is, uh, is determined by a whole heap of interacting uh, laws, uh, systems and institutions that form the society that we live in today. But we can actually change those things and move the line. And fundamentally that's the goal of unions. It's to move uh, this line and make the uh, left side of the box bigger. So why shouldn't the people who do all the work get to decide what to do with the money? Instead of providing material luxury for a very few, we could use it to provide better conditions for absolutely everyone. It's important to note here that half of society doesn't work in the traditional sense because they're unemployed or children or disabled or elderly or whatever else. But it's still obviously hard work looking for a job or raising children or dealing with a disability. Everybody deserves a decent standard of living and to be treated with respect. No, no matter if they happen to be valuable in a narrow market sense or not. And so when we talk about more power for workers, uh, we mean more power for these people too. The money that flows uh, at the moment mostly to uh, super yachts and sports cars for mega rich people should be going to give everybody an absolutely uh, a decent standard of living and to allow even the worst off people in society to be uh, treated with respect and dignity. So what's really at stake here isn't just a bit of extra cash in the hand each week. Obviously, getting a whole heap of extra money would be great. But like I said, a lot of us tech workers, we may be doing okay financially. And we've all seen Breaking Bad, and there was a real lesson there that uh, a whole pile of extra money doesn't necessarily need to happiness. Uh, and so, us te so um, nevertheless, bad things can happen to us when we least expect it. I myself wasn't a union member uh, until a few years ago. I joined mostly for ideological reasons rather than for any uh, urgent practical need. But then... Uh, a few months after, um, I had a little uh, free speech incident. So this wasn't a James Damore type situation uh, where, where I said something bigoted. Uh, I was punching upwards, not downwards. But nevertheless, it looked for a couple of days like I might get fired or something. Obviously, this was a super stressful experience, but it was made a lot less stressful because I had a union representative who helped me through it, advised me, even attended meetings uh, with me to help resolve the issue. So in this way, being a union member is kind of like an insurance policy where you think you probably don't need it right up until you really, really need it. When I moved to Australia, I joined uh, Professionals Australia, which is a uh, union that represents tech workers and scientists. They also provide this sort of support and advice at work. Luckily, I've had no more uh, free speech incidents, and so I haven't tested them out in this regard. But they also do useful things like advise you on contracts and salaries, tell you if you're being underpaid, and do lobbying work to represent our interests things like salary transparency, gender and diversity in the workplace, IP law and climate change. Uh, there's also a really great union called uh, Australian Services Union or ASU that cover people in our line of work and uh, do really good things. But anyway, as I said, uh, most people who work in tech are doing okay financially and they're, and they're pretty secure in their jobs. 
But what we want beyond money and beyond uh, perhaps less stress in our jobs is interesting and meaningful work. We want to work on the problems that interest us uh, using the tools that we prefer and the operating systems we prefer for that matter. And uh, trouble is that, needless to say, every workplace uh, has its problems that get in the way of this to a greater or lesser extent. If you've been a developer for uh, long enough, you've seen projects fail uh, not for technical reasons, uh, but for management reasons. You've seen developers work unpaid overtime, you've seen management buy the wrong software for the wrong reasons, you've seen uh, terrible proprietary software get pushed on clients just for the sales kickbacks, or maybe you've just been forced to put up with bigoted and unacceptable uh, contact from managers and watch them get away with it. Or you might just work in a soulless office where it's too noisy to do your, to, to do your best creative work. So unions can help change, uh, change these things for the better. And we can, and we really should demand better. Why don't we get a seat at the table when all these decisions are made? In countries with uh, higher union membership rates than Australia, unions literally have a seat at the table. So in Sweden, unions appoint uh, directors to the board of directors of all firms with over uh, 25 employees. Similar arrangements exist in other Scandinavian countries and in the larger economies like uh, France and Germany and Europe. So instead of workers simply uh, crossing their fingers and uh, hoping for Google's owners to do no evil, uh, why not simply join together with their colleagues and demand that they do no evil? It's us who should be making decisions about the future of technology because, after all, we built it. But for some reason, we just put up with it instead of demanding better. Can you imagine software developers ever striking? Just picturing it seems kind of unthinkable. It seems like train drivers know how to do it, but not us. Um, but there's absolutely no reason why we couldn't. If we worked together, we'd have some real power to make some change. Imagine if Google's ops team went on strike. Imagine the change that that could create because there's strength in numbers. And if you make positive change within your workplace, uh, that has flow on effects to the rest of society also. For instance, if tech workers work together to uh, stop our employers avoiding tax with tax havens, uh, that would make more tax available for healthcare, infrastructure, education, and decent welfare, and all the other things that make, uh, make for a good society. I feel like this is one big case of imposter syndrome. As a profession, we're naturally skeptical of our own judgment, and we're full of self-doubt. But meanwhile, we're letting those who lack any self-doubt run the whole show. There's a conflict going on, but it's not being fought on equal terms. As Warren Buffett says here, uh, the conflict is very one-sided. And here's how that looks in practice. So here's a low-wage warehouse exploiter, Jeff Bezos, Mr. Do No Evil himself, Larry Page, and uh, privacy violator, Sheryl Sandberg, uh, with uh, Mike Pence and Donald Trump. And of course, uh, tech companies have a long history of collaborating with fascists and white supremacists, uh, just as IBM and its subsidiaries did during World War II. And remember also that Silicon Valley's entire business model is based on shirking regulations to exploit cheap labor. Uber isn't particularly innovative technically, it's kind of a marginally slicker uh, taxi ordering experience, but its real innovation is to profit from the exploitation of low wage workers. Uh, this tweet from uh, high profile Silicon Valley venture capitalist Paul Graham, uh, it's a polite way of saying there's plenty of money to be made by uh, stealing from working people and exploiting them for profit. So these people are working directly against our interests, so it's time we united and worked uh, directly against theirs. So returning to this diagram, the nature of the conflict is simple. It's two parts, very straightforward. However, capitalism is very good at obscuring the nature of, of the conflict, or even denying that it exists. Um, the capital ownership class is full of ghost stories about how the owners are job creators and the system would collapse without them. Uh, destroying civilization while insisting uh, you're, the, you're the only ones keeping it together takes a special kind of dishonesty, and yet here we are. Frederick Jameson famously said that it's easier to imagine the end of the world than imagine the end of capitalism. We know the planet's getting destroyed. We know politicians in the media lie. They know that we know they lie. But nonetheless, the system continues on. The main problem is it's hard to picture what a different world would look like. There's been a failure of vision, particularly after the last 30 years of neoliberal consensus, Reaganomics, and the sabotage and collapse of any rivals to Western capitalism. So how do we go about uh, working towards an alternative uh, without resorting to uh, naive utopianism? Well, while the U USA and the UK uh, seem to be heading further and further towards total plutocracy, and while Australia seems eager to follow in their footsteps, 
Other countries are setting examples that um, give us more hope. And so here's a chart of uh, the level of public ownership in various countries. And they might be a little hard to, they might be a little hard to read, but um, the, the message here is that if our goal is common ownership, there are governments that are doing a pretty good job of actually moving towards all that. Uh, in recent decades, uh, most of the first world economies have moved towards complete privatization. Uh, China too, uh, which is the red line, has seen a shift of wealth into private hands uh, as it has adopted uh, market-based reforms. But as you can see, Norway has bucked the trend in a big way. Even at the start of the graph in 1978, uh, it was higher than the others and has, and has steadily grown over time. So Norway winds up having 60% of its wealth in public hands and every other country uh, has it near zero. A big part of the reason for this is that Norway has a massive fund of capital that's held in common public ownership. And this is taken directly from the fund's website. As you can see, the it owns more than 1% of all the publicly traded stock in the world, as well as quite a lot of real estate. So the total size of the fund is approaching 1 trillion US dollars, or 200,000 US dollars for every single uh, Norwegian. So Norway initially built this fund from the proceeds of its uh, domestic oil resources, but it's now invested in uh, non-oil resources internationally, including in things like real estate in New York. Now obviously, not every country is lucky enough to discover vast quantities of natural resources. But fundamentally, all capital really works in the same way. Every country has uh, income generating capital in the form of real estate and stocks and whatever else. And all that's really required is the political will to grab it up and put more of it in common ownership. The real achievement here isn't discovering oil, but actually keeping it in public hands. Sadly, while Australia has had a similarly historic uh, resource boom in recent years, uh, they haven't been able to do what Norway did, and instead of the wealth uh, benefiting us all, it's all flowed into billionaires' pockets. But the point is that anybody can do this. Nobody else has a pool of capital the size as, as Norway's, but uh, many countries can um, set up funds like this, and plenty already have. So New Zealand has had a similar but much smaller fund for many years now. Uh, contribu contributions were suspended immediately a, a decade or so ago, so ago when the uh, right-wing government took power. But um, under Jacinda Ardern's new Labour government, they've immediately uh, resumed contributions. And this was the moment when they did, and they all seem uh, pretty happy about it. But if we want to move towards um, common ownership of uh, the means of production, we need something grander than just running a few funds here and there in an otherwise privately owned economy. If we're truly going to put ourselves in control, we need a plan to transition the lion's share of capital into public ownership. So back in the 1970s, um, another Scandinavian country called Sweden uh, started implementing, in, implementing a plan to do just this. So the plan enabled the creation of what were called wage earner funds, which would move a percentage of a company's profits into the control of unions and the wider public. So in the course of a few decades, more and more control would, um, would flow to unions themselves, who would eventually run the capital entirely, and the funds would flow to the public as a whole. Such a plan, though, only became imaginable because Sweden had exceptionally strong unions. Nearly 80% of the workforce in Sweden at the time uh, was unionised, and today in Australia it's less than 20%. Unfortunately, uh, this plan failed in the long term in, in the face of predictable opposition from business interests. But technically it was sound, highly pragmatic, and a useful example of how, in the long term, we could build a uh, future beyond late-stage capitalism. But the lesson here is, a, is that to win against the forces of the ownership class, there's no alternative but to directly challenge capital and to build the forces to do so. As Warren Buffett said, they're making war against us every day and winning because, sadly, they're better at organising than we are. So we can't form an effective challenge unless we rebuild organised labour build institutions large and powerful enough to take on the enemy. Our software developers are in a unique position to do that. Because we're one of the few jobs that isn't getting automated out of existence, uh, we have a stronger negotiating position in the labour market. And that gives us strength to make change, if only we dare to use it by unionising. Tech workers are also in a unique position to be able to help build the tools to make us win. Uh, the front page story of the Sydney Morning Herald today was literally about unions and the technology they use, so it seems like it's pretty important stuff. Uh, campaigns, though, are often run on poor quality proprietary organising software because we haven't built better alternatives yet. 
It's also way harder than it should be to actually sign up to a union online, but I am working on that. Uh, we'll win by helping people communicate and build solidarity and find common ground, and good software helps to do that. Even small projects can make a big difference. This site, for instance, is built by a union called United Voice, and it allows hospitality workers to do exactly what it says on the label, which is rate their boss. For somebody stuck in a bad job, something like this can mean the difference between them feeling like they're alone in their struggle and instead feeling like there are others out there, perhaps in a, in a similar situation or at least supporting their cause. And it's from that feeling of shared cause that real change actually happens. The scale of political problems can make them seem uh, very severe and hard to change. But we're, at a, we're at a pivotal moment in politics. Uh, the last 30 years of neoliberal consensus have collapsed. People are angry because they know that the system is screwing them over. Unfortunately, without a coherent alternative, people will turn to white supremacist hucksters like Trump. And if we don't defeat the forces of capital, uh, all we'll do is turn to racism and hatred and defeat each other. That's unfortunately our future, unless we go ahead and actually build an alternative. So I'll leave you with this quote by uh, the great Ursula Le Guin, who sadly died a couple of days ago. Um, Our art is code, and uh, that art has great power. All we have to do is choose to actually use it. Thanks. Got some time for questions, I think. Is that, is that right? Yeah, any questions? Any questions? Uh, just yell it out, I'll repeat it. Uh, okay. So the workers in the companies who are getting screwed, why don't they just grab a slice of the profits by quitting their jobs and starting their own companies? Disclaimer, I have personally done this twice. <laughs> so the question is, what about just leaving and starting a, your own company? It's a free country. Is that right? Well, because not everyone has the talent and ability to do that. And much of the economy runs on uh, things that have high barriers to entry. Like, very difficult to set up a uh, you know, power company or a, or a uh, telco if, you're, uh, if you've got you know, no money or anything. It's, it's a, uh, you, know, you need to be on a certain economic level to, to start that. Any other questions? Yes? How widespread is open source software within the union? How widespread is open source software within the union movement? Mm, well, it's growing. Um, so unfortunately, a, a, a lot of um, campaigning software is still running on um, proprietary, uh, proprietary things like Nation Builder. Um, so unfortunately, in the NGO space, Nation Builder is very dominant and um, costs, costs NGOs a lot of money that they could otherwise be using on campaigning. And also, it's pretty uh, um, ineffective, generally. So. Um, yeah, like I said, building these alternatives is, is important. Uh, down the front here. Um, so as far as I know, most tech workers in Australia would be covered by PESMA, the Professionals Australia, who are pretty much a bosses union. Like, what, what kind of alternatives do we have or what could we do to break out of that? Well, I suppose if you don't like... Uh, I'll re oh. Sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll do it. Uh, PESMA appears to be a bosses union. Is there any viable alternatives to break out of that? Uh, okay, so I guess if you don't like the particular union that covers you, you look for an alternative union, like ASU also covers software developers, and there's also the potential of um, starting, uh, starting different unions or getting involved in uh, the one that you could join but don't like very much and reforming it from within. I guess it's a... Uh, it's like any other aspect of politics. You just have to get involved and try and influence things the, the way you want to influence them. Up the back there, yep. Um, kind of tangential to your statement here, how do you reckon this with uh, universal basic income? So, so the question is, how do you reconcile uh, unionism with the idea of universal basic income, uh, which may need some explanation first, if you understand that? Yeah, so uh, most people probably know what universal basic income is, but it's the concept of everybody receiving uh, a fixed amount of money uh, every, every month and, and all, all the same money, no matter what situation you're in. So obviously that, that, I think that ties in with building uh, common ownership of capital quite nicely, because if you, have a, if you have a large fund of commonly owned capital that's generating uh, money all the time, you can use that to uh, fund 
scheme, schemes like universal basic income or, or whatever else you think is going to be of, uh, of benefit to everybody as opposed to a few. Any other questions? Yes. The question is, how do we make unionism more fashionable, particularly in the media? Yeah, it certainly gets a bad rap in the media, and you know, as we've seen with the train strike, um, oftentimes they get cast as the bad guys, even though the train network is getting run, you know, way, way over capacity, and it's and it's fair enough for them to, um, you know, protest those conditions any way they can. Um, so, I guess again, it's about um, building solidarity and uh, building. Building institutions that are alternatives to the to the media, who who basically get um, like the media gets run effectively by the owners of the media, and so will always represent their viewpoint to a certain extent. But if we build um, if we build other institutions, other opposing institutions, uh, from there uh, from there we can change it. But there's there's no easy answer to um, to uh, media games because fundamentally it's all it's all PR, and that's uh, that's a money driven exercise. Anyone else? I have another. Qu I have a question, if that's okay. Uh, as an employer, sorry, Lindsay. As an employer in the tech industry, I've observed that many tech companies, some of the ones you managed, to keep this on focus to tech, uh, actually do treat their employees quite well. They fight for them and uh, give them, I don't know, back rubs and sushi and stuff. Um, and so, like, really, what you know, when when the employee is the asset and the tech company has to compete for them. You can see why they don't really think that unions are particularly relevant. So, how would you make unions relevant in a world where the brains are the are the, the capital that tech companies fight over? Yeah, well, I, I guess like we are a bit comfortable in a lot of ways. Like a yeah. little bit, little, a little bit too happy, and uh, you know, life's a little bit too easy in, 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 in certain ways for 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 us techies. But um, you know, it's, I, I guess it's about thinking uh, thinking of the wider world and. Um, and it's less about like material conditions than decision making. For instance, like Bill Gates, uh, the money that, the money that he's accumulated, he's not using it to like it's more than he could ever spend. But he's using it to make uh, decisions about uh, health policy and education policy. And you know, just just because you're good at um, you know selling selling copies of software doesn't mean that uh, it gives you the right to make those decisions on behalf of everybody else. We should be making those more more collectively. So um, yeah, it's about thinking wider. I think. Sure. Lindsay. Uh, Sorry. Do you think that a, in Australia in particular, there, uh, it would be viable to have a tech worker specific union? And if so, what are the, like, the top two to three outcomes you think that, that that union should be striving for? Question is, do you think that a tech worker specific union would be viable in Australia? And if so, what should its top three outcomes or priorities be? The trouble is that at the moment, um, union membership among uh, private sector tech workers is really, really low, and like, it's, it's part of the mo motivation for this talk, but um, I think perhaps it needs to get a little bit bigger before a, a separate union is viable, but may, maybe it would be a good idea. Um, obviously, it would be focused on doing the things I've talked about, building uh, more, uh, I, I guess, more self-determination for tech workers, uh, influence in over, over policy, IP, um, but then also contributing like because uh, you know, tech workers can make a lot of money um, contributing to uh, a broader society, and um, and uh, common capital ownership would be would be good. Had another question over here. I was just going to say, I mean, why you use open source software when Windows is there, and it's essentially free when you buy your computer. It's the same reason to join a union when you're a when you're a well-paid tech worker. You know, it's about freedom. So is that question for me? No, that's. Uh, I can answer well, it, but I'm just one, I'm not the actual point, speaker. Uh, yeah, it's that kind of idea of it's a freedom. Uh, I'll, ref I'll, I'll rephrase the question if I can. Yeah. Um, the question is, uh, if it's easy, why should we choose freedom? <laughs> well, yeah. I, <laughs> I, guess, I guess you have to be motivated by uh, th thinking about something wider and th thinking about the uh, state of the world at large. Well-fed people don't start revolutions. <laughs> the comment yeah. was, well-fed people don't start revolutions. Yeah, well, I don't think... Um, it seems like there isn't going to be revolution anytime soon. All we can do is, like, recognise the situation we're in, 
move towards alternatives, fortunately. Uh, last question up the back, perhaps. Sorry, there's a few clauses in that question. I'm just going to have to step through that slowly <laughs> and translate that. Um, can you just repeat the first part? Collective bargaining. Yeah. Uh, the collective bargaining that unions make possible. Like, unions make collective bargaining possible. Um, so do you imagine that that could be used or would be used to develop technology that is more respecting of user freedom? So could we use collective bargaining that unions provide to uh, uh, enable users to have more freedom individually? Yeah. Well, obviously, if you have more negotiating power in your workplace, uh, you can make better demands. If you, uh, if you as, a, um, as a workforce think that free software is important, you can, uh, and you've got negotiating power, you can uh, demand to work on that. You can, you can demand that your employer contributes more to it. And, um, and, you, and you can demand that your company acts more ethically. So plenty of ways to influence that in more direction. It's about um, you know, using using the negotiating power that you have at your disposal. Is that an outcome you're interested in? Certainly is, yeah. Awesome. We actually have quite a fair bit of time, so if we want to keep going on this, happy to. Plenty more questions. Yeah, I think I blasted through that a little fast, so yeah. If you have more questions, uh, ask them now or come up or whatever. Anyone else? We all good? One more, yep. So the question is, uh, what would you suggest for contractors, and perhaps more broadly, you know, what role could unions play with, uh, you know, contractors and individual relationships between individuals and businesses? Yeah, I mean, part of the problem with um, employment law over over the recent years is that um, the the nature of employment is that it's become progressively more casualised, contracts have become progressively weaker, and so you. Um, a lot of people lack those protections. Less than half of the, of, of the workforce is in stable full-time work. Most people are on insecure, contra uh, insecure contracts. And, um, you know, contracting is, um, is you know, it's, it's nice work if you can get it and you're getting paid, but it's also very insecure, uh, getting fired at short notice and having people uh, not pay the bills. It leaves you with very little protection and, the, and there is very little you can do um, uh, under the law to remedy that, and that, that really sucks. So, um, I mean, the long-term solution for that is about getting, uh, getting better employment law and um, more, more powerful people in that situation, and that ties into the, um, the whole uh, collective solidarity and um, getting ourselves more rights. Thanks. Any other questions? No, we're all good. Uh, I happen to, just to add something to this, I'm a, a small business employer. Uh, I, I'd love to have a little debate afterwards if anyone wants to join in about what it takes to employ tech people in the long term and what it takes to retain them. I'm quite proud of that. Lindsay is an ex-employee of mine and all my, actually there's about five or six of them here at the conference. Very proud of that, the relationship I've had. Um, I, it's not something for everyone to be that kind of person and we've done it without unions but I'd love to actually have that as a, as a, as a data point if you're interested. You still work hard, right? Well, I work harder than everyone else. So. <laughs> then, then, <laughs> the question then sometimes is who works for who, but you know that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you you know if you work if you're working if you're working hard, then uh, you know you're a worker. You're a good guy, probably. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, everyone, and thank you. <laughs>